Welcome to the Stockton Seminar Series. My name is Professor James Kraska, and it's a real honor for us here at the Stockton Center for International Law to have three outstanding presentations from experts in Indian Ocean maritime security and law. First, I'd like to introduce Captain Srabjit Parmar. He's the Executive Director of the National Maritime Foundation, and he has decades of experience in strategy and concept development with the Indian Navy and the Minister, Ministry of Defense. Also, we have Commander Kumar, who joins us. He's the Deputy Director of the National Maritime Foundation, and he has decades of experience with fleet operations, and he's a specialist in anti-submarine warfare. And finally, we have Dr. Bimel Patel, who comes to us as the Director General or the Dean of Raksha, Rak, Raksha Shakti University in India. He's the former Dean of Gujarat National Law University. He's a member of the National Security Council Advisory Board. Welcome, gentlemen, and we very much appreciate your thoughts and comments on maritime security in the Indo-Pacific. And with that brief introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Parmar. Sir? Thank you, James. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I've given five minutes to a broad brush on uh, what I will call the Indo-Pacific. And first of all, we have to understand what is the Indo-Pacific? What is the Indo-Pacific from India's point of view, from the American point of view, from the Japanese point of view? If at all that concept has to emerge as a construct, whether it's security or it's economic or holistic maritime security, we need to have a consensus. I take a leaf from uh, Barry Guzan's theory on regional security concepts, in which he says he's divided the whole world into various regions and the regions changed after the Cold War was over. And among all the points which defined a region, one of them was durable periods of amity and enmity. Now this is applicable to all sub-regions. So even if you look at various sub-regions in the Indo-Pacific, you need to amalgamate them together, come to a consensus, to an understanding of what is the Indo-Pacific. Then only can the Indo-Pacific as a concept and lines thereon gain importance. For the simple reason that it is still developing. And today we have the COVID situation, which has thrown the whole world into turmoil. And therefore the impact of COVID-19 on the maritime capabilities of nations is still being assessed. I don't have to give you examples of Theodore Roosevelt or uh, the French carrier Falk or a Russian nuclear submarine that was tied up alongside. All nations have been impacted in some way. These are trying times, or as Henry Kissinger said, we are living in dangerous times. We need to work together. We need to pull together. COVID-19 situation, who's taking advantage? I really don't know. Are the Chinese as strong as they claim to be? I don't have an idea right now. Maybe it'll take a better part of a year for us to analyze as to who is going to come out tops. But in the meantime, if you're going to look at Indo-Pacific Indo maritime security, we need to come to a consensus and see it from the same lens, if not similar. I'll pause here. Thank you. Commander Kumar, would you like to go? Yeah, I'll uh, do that. Uh, can you uh, uh, enable my screen share? Uh, yeah, considering that uh, I thought that we are discussing now the uh, naval or military aspect of what we discussed. Am I audible? You're good to go. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, if we see this entire map here, the Indo Indian Ocean region, including the South China Sea, it's a vast thing and it has got the centrality and what we talked about that it has got the ocean churn, which is already happening, and there is a requirement to consider it as a holistic holistic problem and then uh, sort out the issue by not uh, having uh, getting a divided different different regional uh, bouquet but having a one consolidated inner in any one can be picked up maybe ions is a good idea 
this holistic uh, maritime security which i discussed uh, i very much believe that if until unless we look at the entire situation as a whole uh, we will miss out on something and our efforts may not be as effective as it is as that that's what we are seeing the non traditional threats also uh, we have seen that they are all closely combined with each other we if we see human trafficking there is some requirement uh, reason for it because of the uh, economy there is arms trafficking everything is interrelated and that's why we have, we cannot look at one particular thing and go however after this the important thing comes that for as a naval person how do i enforce laws in our maritime zones because these things we do confront so one uh, is that we can invoke right to visit that article 110 and in that most important thing is that the flag state content is not required so most of the non traditional security threat which are there if a naval vessel or if a naval practitioner faces he can invoke the right to visit article 110 and go ahead and do the law prevention at least and wait in the time the coast guard comes to carry out the law enforcement or right to hot pursuit for the ship which has violated the law second option can be maritime law enforcement as a simple routine peace time operation and this will be only thing that we will have to be careful to remain within the existing international law that is we should not cross the uh, the the level of uh, use of force where it becomes a human rights law till that time we are there i think as a law enforcement we will not have a problem the most difficult thing comes is the military maritime militia in the south china sea which is affecting and they are uh, milling around wherever the naval vessels are there so how do we tackle them because if we uh, go and directly attack them then they, there will be a human rights issue that they are a fishing boat however if we can prove that they are acting as a auxiliary during the armed conflict or while they are doing that means if they if can prove that their nature is not purely fishing then we will be able to enforce the law enforcement however for that i feel video and audio recordings will play a law, large large important role because it will show how the thing graduated what all checks and balances has been done for the force which you use the force to ensure and ascertain that the vessel indeed is not involved in a legal fishing activity so uh, or if the country has got some fishing regulations apprehend the vessel treat the vessel as military instrument in times of armed conflict now this navigation through nine days law i think i have talked with about this with professor kast kaska earlier also and there was a mail i sent about the freedom of navigation i think there is no requirement to term it as a freedom of navigation unclos gives us every right to go within the 12 miles and icj also has given the same remarks it says inherent right of innocent passage so there there, there should not be any hesitation in going there denial of rights it says that a, a, a state can for a time being regulate the innocent passage but only for the time time being it does not mean that it can be forever and for that even professor patel gave an example of corpo channel case and at the end i would sum up uh, with this if you see this picture uh, john what can you see i see both an older couple i see um a chalice and i see a musician another musician there are more there is a lady here there is something here the bottle hanging what i am trying to say that the more i read on clause it depends on the figure and ground the more you read the, the perspective from you want to see it it gives you that understanding so if we if you want i think unclos can give many many answers for which we are struggling right now that's all thank you thank you very much commander kumar and professor uh, patel and turn it over to you please thank you james um very much uh, my major questions again arise with how the indo pacific construct which apparently looks to establish cooperation to make the indian ocean more stable and perhaps one of the intentions could be 
to uh, prevent any power which would like not to respect the international law of the sea and generally the question comes and the whole world targets China. Um, as I also mentioned, there are significant differences um, on almost all aspects of maritime zones. So if you're talking baselines, TS, CZ, in fact, the US um, practice vis-a-vis -vis its own ratification of 1958 conventions and its um, reluctance to join UNCLOS itself is going to be a big challenge because let's keep in mind that US might be very well dragged before any international tribunal uh, successfully or unsuccessfully, we do not know. If US would like to uh, go for more liberal navigational rights, which are directly in conflict with 1958 uh, conventions to which it is a party. Uh, as I also mentioned, the question of historical title. Um, well, the South China Sea Arbitration Award has um, given some ideas on historical titles and special circumstances, but let's, for, let's not forget that US and Japan itself would have a very hard time uh, not to accept the arbitral award uh, you know, for its own purposes, because if they would like to deny China, then they have to deny it to themselves. So I do not see so far literature coming out how the US and Japan uh, in their respective regions are, are, are interpreting uh, the practices. I also raised the question of um, international states and archipelagic uh, sea waters. A uh, number of Pacific states with which uh, India and US would like to cooperate. Um, there are very hard times. Indonesia, for example, North South Axis is not yet defined. Philippines is under tremendous pressure. Uh, in view of this, uh, what will happen? Because as I said, uh, the US uh, has drawn straight baselines on a number of its areas and um, US is denying or consistently protesting against also in, including India on the straight baseline. Uh, why? So for example, would US continue to protest uh, and what, how this protest will turn around? So does it mean that, for example, if India or other countries would like to come up with straight baseline method and would they succumb to US pressure under this so-called Indo-Pacific cooperation? I think this is a very, very fundamental question, which I don't think would be in the interest of a number of the Indian Ocean states, which, you know, which would like to have Indo-Pacific. So therefore, I believe that Indo-Pacific cooperation will, will have a very uh, roller coaster journey. Um, one very specific point which I consider is, I personally believe that US is far less interested in all other soft law, uh, soft law of the sea problems such as maritime environmental pollution, human smuggling. US doesn't care, in my view. US is more interested in military activities. And uh, therefore it is very important to keep in mind how Indo-Pacific regime will deal with military activities in the EZ because the large number of Indian Ocean states have different interpretations than the US practice. US is insisting upon absolute freedom of navigation, as it is important for her economic, security, strategic relations, and global dominance. How the IOR countries would react to this regime of permissible activities advocated and practiced by the US in the ESA is very, very crucial. For example, will Indo Pacific countries allow military activities, including surveillance and training? Because I believe that Indo-Pacific regime would be very interested in doing surveillance and monitoring, sorry, training not only for Indian Ocean, but you know, we are looking at China, we are looking at Russia as well. And therefore, I fully appreciate the concerns which China and Russia has vis-a-vis -vis the Indo-Pacific construct, because I don't think the Indo-Pacific the Indo-Pacific construct actually is coming in direct conflict with the with the Russian and Chinese interests. So we cannot, we cannot be oblivion to the interests of these um, two major powers as well. Uh, as I also said that our own practice, we would like to retain authority to regulate military activities in the EZ. Uh, does this mean that India and US will gradually reconcile our views and in what direction? And let's not forget about Article 301 and Article 204. And if we read 
Article 88, uh, which says about high seas for peaceful purposes, and this provision applies to Israel. For us, peaceful purposes means, you know, the military activities as well. So, are we talking some sort of uh, gradual erosion of uh, the Indian concept of non permissibility of military activities in Israel? I very much doubt. And uh, therefore, uh, US would certainly not like to have any limit. And if that is the case, it will be directly at crossroads with uh, countries. So uh, this, these are very, very hard questions um, which, which we all have to address. And therefore, maybe a soft um, understanding, not maybe arrangements, are very important, at least among the four quad countries. Um, let's not forget that if Indo-Pacific regime is being, will be perceived or not only by Russia and China, but also other Pacific countries, including other, you know, I'm talking even Japan, I'm looking here on, on the other side of the world, also Canada. I think these countries would not appreciate if, um, if we will move in the direction, which, you know, uh, which would actually come uh, into conflict with their interests as well. So I think we have, we have a lot of hard bargaining to do and we also to do a bit of strategic communication to these countries as well that this Indo-Pacific cooperation is not intended to contain uh, any particular country. It still allows the national interest to prevail as, as my colleagues also said, you know, national interest when Henry Kissinger was here, when he addressed us in December uh, last year only, he was very clear. He said to us, to the National Security Advisory Board, what matters is the national interest. And I do not think neither India nor any of these specific countries would like to give up this, uh, their national interest for the so-called emerging Indo-Pacific co uh, cooperation, especially when the, the, you know, the, the intentions are not known to large number of um, countries. So at this stage, as I said, I, I sound very, you know, uh, sounding well, alarm bells and music to the ears, particularly my colleagues in the US, you know, defense or US NWC. But I think um, we have to move it very, very cautiously and we have to address simultaneously concerns of um, not only the foes or adversaries, but also the friends in the Pacific, broader Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments, uh, Dr. Patel. And with that, um, uh, Commander Kumar, you have an additional thoughts that you'd like to share. Please go ahead. Uh, no, I, I just wanted to uh, raise a discussion with uh, Professor Patel. Uh, sir, your uh, point with regards to not having military activity in EZ by India, uh, let's say India, uh, have you looked into this possibility of uh, reciprocity? If we uh, hold on to very strongly that in our EZ we will not allow military activity. Then if we are going out as a blue water navy and we also have our aspirations to become a you know, provider of net security or go to other countries to look into and expand ourselves, then will it not be you know, straining us? So from that point of view, as a responsible power, which remains within the bounds of law and honors the law and expects others also to do it. Is it not that we should, our stand on ease it should start changing? Because if we are holding on to it, then tomorrow nothing stops, let's say, uh, Oban or UAE or uh, any other country uh, which allows free, uh, free military activities to say, hello, in our area also you can't do because it is reciprocity. So probably from that point of view, also we need to have a thought about it. That's all. Uh, thank you very much um, for those thoughts as well. And so I think, uh, are we out of time, Colonel Cherry? Unfortunately, we are, sir. We have to close out the session. Okay. Well, that's wonderful, though. It uh, really provides a, a, a really nice presentation. I think um, all of you are very complimentary beginning with a, a strategic uh, focus from the captain and then um, more of the operational level uh, from uh, Commander Kumar and then Bimal with some sort of broad um, international law issues and policy issues. 
a really wonderful collection. I think this is going to be helpful for the students at the Naval War College, and we deeply appreciate all three of you sincerely. 